I'm not going to talk for very long because I know people are tired. It's yes. a very long day. And we have an early morning. But just wanted to review a little bit uh, what we've been doing, why we've been doing it, where we are. So today, you completed your Buddhist holy sites pilgrimage, visiting Sarnath, which was the, uh, the last holy site on our itinerary. And so that was a combination of 15 days of a lot of sincere effort that required determination and focus, sacrifice to be able to come. And then uh, while we were here, we also had to practice quite a lot of patient endurance. But it's all relative, isn't it? And I'm, I'm glad we had that experience just now, seeing a bit more of, in a way, the real India. Yeah. The population of Varanasi is five million. Five million or? <laughs> so the cities, cities tend to be very crowded. And uh, we've been lucky because we've been going into these archaeological sites with walls around them, which have been preserved and trees have been planted. And we have a bus, which is about half full. And then we come into these hotels and even with that much protection, it, it's hard work, isn't it? Even with that much of a kind of a cushion and a protection, because the lives that we come from, we take for granted so much comfort, so much order, so much cleanliness. And uh, so India, even when we try to make it comfortable, is a bit of a shock. But I think we've done very well. And uh, the comfort was intended, I said to all of you, that uh, going to be taking a bit longer to prepare this trip so that we could do it properly and we could do it well. And we could spend a bit more time and we could stay in more comfortable places precisely for that reason, so that at least you get a rest and we remember what we're here for and we're able to bring a happy mind to the holy sites to really... Ha you need a certain level of happiness, don't you, to be able to reflect on it. Uh, more deeply on the conditions of life. You need a certain amount of well-being. And uh, that's a foundation for samadhi. And then with the samadhi, you can develop insight. So I really wanted us to have that comfort so that we could also, so that we could have repeated exposure to each site, which we did have. We've been able to go to each of these places several times. In Bodhgaya, we went many times. So um, we did a lot of practice. We did a lot of chanting. We did a lot of reflection. And uh, I think we did very well. So I rejoice in everyone's merit. I'm very happy that it was as successful as it has been. It's not over yet, but it's almost over. And just having a look at that scene, getting on the rickshaws, as you were getting on the rickshaws, and um, <laughs> after the attempt to see the Arati Puja at the Ghats, the monks, uh, because of our rules, we couldn't get on a human-driven rickshaw so we took a taxi and so we got there 10 minutes before you so we saw we saw <laughs> is that mudita is that mudita <laughs> so we saw 10 minutes of it and uh, you guys turned up for the last minute but at least you got that rickshaw ride and at least you got the, the vibe of the river and you got to see many of you got a red splotch on your forehead or so <laughs> But then what I think was really valuable, as well as seeing the Brahmin priest praying and getting a sense of where we are now in Varanasi, and uh, seeing these beautiful ancient rituals which have been occurring for 5,000 years, and then, or maybe longer, but then also to go and see the life, get a little glimpse of the life of a rickshaw waller. And uh, it's really rough and it's really harsh. Like those guys even though they have their own set of wheels, or maybe they don't, maybe they rent them, but they don't have very much freedom. There's a pecking order, there's a mafia. Uh, on every level in this country, there's a, someone else is taking the cream if they can. And uh, people, so those guys are literally having to fight and yell and, and uh, threaten violence just to keep their one set of trousers and their one shirt and their, and their rickshaw and to put some food in their bellies. I don't, didn't see a single overweight rickshaw driver. <laughs> so it's really good to see that because that's probably what half the population of this nation is uh, 
at least in the cities, uh, experiencing. And then, you know, India is so full of these sometimes just bitter, but uh, often just bitter, but occasionally bitter, sweet uh, examples of beings with different levels of, of barami, but also different levels of karma. So one thing that happened to me on the way back to the taxi was one very hungry-looking boy, about 15 probably, was trying to sell a packet of postcards. And we've all had experience now of, of those touts who are really aggressive, in your face. They're just going to hassle you. Even you said no, even 10 times, even you say, we don't have money. Uh, our tour guide told us not to bring it. And uh, they just hassle you. And this boy, I said to him, I didn't bring any money. He said, he put down his postcards and he said, okay, sir, tomorrow. And then he walked with us through all the streets until he saw us to our taxi. And there was a genuine human feeling of he heard what I said the first time. He accepted it. And given that he wasn't going to make a sale, he acted as a friend. It's very touching to see in this kind of swarm of uh, phenomena, much of it very harsh, that you can see a beautiful human moment. And for me, it's like, what is this? As monks, we, we train ourselves in developing qualities and we train ourselves in recognizing qualities. You need to know what is a good quality. You need to know what isn't a good quality. We relinquish, all Buddhist practitioners, all of you, we're all doing this, we relinquish unwholesome qualities and we embrace and cultivate wholesome qualities. This is the Awada Padimoka, do good, avoid harm, purify the mind. We're all doing that. And then, but you just see, here is a person who, for whatever reason, has some accumulated virtue and some goodness, who is experiencing very harsh karma, but is still somehow maintaining his uh, humanity. And there's that boy in Bogaya, uh, Gautam, who has touched us very deeply for the same reason. Somehow, amongst all the stealing and the begging and the lying and the cheating, this one guy uh, retains a remarkable quality of truthfulness, which is very disarming and very touching, and then you feel like you want to take care of this one. So you can see, uh, for me, it points very clearly to karma and to rebirth. It's like we all come in with certain qualities, and then we have our karmic challenges. We have the merits, which give us our opportunities, and then we have the karmic challenges, which can be really difficult. Another thing that the Thai monk saw at Sana, there was one boy, he came to try to sell one of those clay Buddha statues. It was very, he had his hand in both his pockets, and unfortunately the fly was completely ripped, and he, he's so uh, unaware, he's so beaten down by life, he's so skinny, but he's got his hands in his pockets, and his penis is literally hanging out and he's unaware of it, and he's trying to sell one of those 10 rupee clay Buddhas for 100 rupees. So, of course, we, uh, Chai Ek bought it, or somebody bought it, the oh, 10, and then we noticed the trousers, and Chai Ek gave him 150 rupees to please get a new set of trousers. And, uh, of course, as soon as we turned around, a bigger boy, who was much better dressed, took the money from him. Mm-hmm. So it's like the Thai monk saw that. So this is the kind of thing that you see again and again in this country. You try to do something to help somebody who's suffering uh, have a little bit of relief from their suffering. And the moment you do, uh, something bigger comes and takes it, and they suffer more than they were just moments before. You see this again and again. And it's a really good thing to see for all of us, because that young boy would not be experiencing that if he had not done that to others. You know, that's what it comes down to. It's like, our intention is to help him just to have clothes on his, on his body and to have a decent meal. And as soon as we give it, it's taken again. So he must have stolen, he must have uh, persecuted beings. And so this is, uh, you know, India, it's, it's good to get out there occasionally and have a good look at it because it really, I don't think any of us are stealing and none of us are persecuting, but it just reminds us about this, this, this karma. Now, another thing that happened today, just speaking about karma, is, uh, isn't it interesting that at the culmination of your paying respects at the four primary holy sites, that as we're going into the museum, one of Thailand's living enlightened masters is coming out of the museum. And he happens to have five minutes available to sit on a seat so that you can all pay respects to him. These kind of things don't arise without causes. Now, he has a group 
of nine monks and 45 lay people, and he was coming out to go to the bathroom, and his group was inside. Now that could not have been planned. When, when we planned this itinerary, I only found out a couple of weeks before we came that I didn't know would be here, and that we may meet him in Sarnath. So that's how it happened. I was really glad that we didn't bump into him when we were shopping at the front. <laughs> in, in general, I think we kept the shopping to a really good level, and today's shopping was a reward for having, for having been so focused, and uh, to help you have a few uh, things to recollect uh, your trip with happiness as a bit of a reward. But then the timing was perfect. We're going into the museum, Tanajana Nani is stepping out of the step at that moment. So again, it points to karma, and this is like incredibly good karma. And the kind of karma that comes from paying respects to Buddhist holy sites and making the aspiration to realize truth and to never be separated from the teachings, that's what happens. You've got the merit, then you meet these beings, then you pay respect with a mind of faith, and what's going to happen? You'll be meeting more of these beings in more doorsteps in the future, which is a really wonderful thing. So. All of us here have a lot of merit. You wouldn't have been able to sign up for the tour without it. And you, now you have more. Now, the particular challenge that we all have is recognizing in a consistent way the blessings of our life. Because the thing about avidya and is sometimes called ignorance, but it's also likened to forgetting. Beings whose minds are affected by avidya forget. And the thing... Mindfulness is often translated in Thai as right recollection. So, avidya is a thing that's forgetting. It's forgetting impermanence. It's forgetting not self. It's forgetting unsatisfactoriness. It's trying to find a lasting happiness in the conditions. It's trying to find something permanent in the conditions. And uh, then we then we find ourselves all of a sudden with suffering that we weren't that we weren't ready for again. And so. Mindfulness is right recollection as one of the uh, eightfold path. So it's recognizing the immense good fortune that we have, recognizing consistently our aspiration to keep practicing, and then doing it. So I know we've all made prayers, deep prayers, in very powerful place to be able to do this, but that's our particular challenge. Uh, part of the problem of having a comfortable life is that you can forget. You can forget because that grinding suffering that those rickshaw uh, drivers experience. We don't experience it. We might experience it occasionally, but a lot of the suffering we experience is more emotional. Someone doesn't behave the way you want them to. Someone says something that you think they shouldn't have said, and then that can cause an enormous amount of pain. And it's, it's not that it's not as real. It's just as real. And it's also karmically conditioned. But it's not the same as that grinding, oppressive, just struggle for survival. So we need to use our right recollection, begin our day with meditation, turning off the mobile phone, not checking the email, begin the day with meditation so that you bring some of this quality of knowing that will be aware of your good fortune and also to keep our challenges and our suffering in perspective so that we don't make too much of a problem out of something that, something that isn't that much of a problem. And Ajahn Chah says in his teachings that a large part of practice is making big suffering into little suffering and making little suffering into no suffering. You have to, we have to use our wise reflection and our capacity to let go and our capacity to practice equanimity and our, our capacity to be contented. We have to bring this to our life so that we don't waste our time suffering over things that we don't need to suffer about. And so that we use the incredible good fortune that we have to get on our cushion and meditate, to remember to chant, to listen to the Dharma talk, to make time for the retreat, to come on another pilgrimage, whatever it is, whatever it is in our life that's going to help us to focus. So that's just a bit of an overview about the merit that we've accumulated, the good karma that supported it, the fact that now we've got more good karma and that you've made these aspirations to keep practicing is just a, a wholehearted encouragement to really do that. And it's a, a large part of why I come to India myself. I'm very fortunate that even as an abbot I've been able to come to India and uh, fortunate in many respects because the monastery that I've been building, I've been, I have built it to be simple and easy to run and to be a place that supports meditation so that now 
monks come and are willing to help run it for me and uh, meditate there and I can leave it for periods of time. So I'm, gonna, I'm determined to keep it simple for that reason. I'm determined to keep my monastery a small one and a simple one, but I will take on extra burdens for the sake of helping others like this for periods of time. Okay, because I have a simple monastery, I can take a group of people to India, we can go on pilgrimage, or I can go and teach a retreat in Malaysia. That's the paradigm I'm trying to work with, is keep the monastery simple and small, and then help groups of people for focused periods of time, and then go back to the simple monastery. Because, uh, and this is, I say this as well just to give, to mirror back to you, the value of having a simple life. Whatever you can do in your life, because the simplicity of my life gives me some choice. And having choice, I might even be able to help more people than if I wasn't really careful, and that situation got bigger than it needed to be. So, whatever you can do in your lives to simplify, have a really good look. What is necessary, what is useful, and what is really extra stuff which is actually a distraction. This is the challenge, especially in the time of information media. You've got so many things now. You, you know, for a while, it was just email was, was already taking a lot of time, but now there's the Facebook and the line and the, all the other stuff. So you really need to have a look at how much time does uh, all this communication take, and is it, what's the quality of the communication? Uh, can you cut back on it? Can you make more time to be in communion with your own mind? and uh, practice more. Sending the mind out to other people all the time, it's going to weaken your mindfulness, and uh, it's going to make you tired. So at the end of the day, when it's time to sit, you'll be falling asleep. So uh, lots of people nodding their heads. <laughs> so we need to look at what are we doing that we don't need to do so that at the end of the day, you have more energy and you get on your cushion. And, I, and I'm really hoping that you get on your cushion before your day, begins and that you get on your cushion again at the end of your day. That's what I would hope that uh, lay people who aspire to realize the deathless uh, can make that kind of a commitment because that's the, kind of the commitment that you need. And then as you get older and your responsibilities get less, I would hope that you can meditate three times a day, morning, afternoon and evening. That's uh, I think what we should be aspiring for and hopefully we have long lives so that we can do that. So anyway, just a bit of a review where we went today. Sana, Isipatana, Ajahn O told me the meaning of that, uh, that word, which is uh, really uh, beautiful, and it sets the context for where we are and what happened. Uh, Isi means a rishi, which is a forest-dwelling meditator, and is it patan means falling. Patana in, is it Hindi, is it? Or? In Hindi, it means falling. So it was the place where the rishis fell out of the sky. What does that mean? It means that there were very, very gifted meditators who had the arupa jhanas, the subtle jhanas, who could levitate and fly through the air. And that's where they landed, because that's where they lived. So it had that, that name when the Buddha went there, as being a place where rishis who flew through the air came down. And then it was the Marupataya one, which meant the deer park. So it was a place that the king had allowed to be a, a zone of fearlessness, a zone for practicing harmlessness, so that the deers could be there without being pestered. So this is uh, amazing, because there's not that many cultures are there, there's not that many countries that have a place where the deer can be free and not hunted, and then a place also where uh, the sadhus are cultivating their meditation to the degree that they can fly through the air. So that had already happened even before the Bodhisattva <coughs> Well, the Bodhisattva's attendants came to this deer park and uh, probably practicing alongside of these very gifted rishis. Now, what the Buddha discovered was superior to that. So, in a way, as remarkable as it seems, to have amazing samadhi where you have mastery over the elements, and we were at the place where the Buddha performed the Twin Miracles just uh, yesterday morning, and he, he was the master. He could do more than any other rishi, the twin miracle of radiating fire and water from every pore in his skin while elevating, levitating in the sky. That's what Lord Buddha also showed us that Buddhas can do. But uh, what Lord Buddha discovered is superior to the most refined and most powerful samadhi. What he discovered is subtle. 
And uh, so we chanted this morning and we listened to others chanting. It was very beautiful, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. To hear so all these other groups chanting there. And, and uh, in the tradition of the Sāvakas, really lovely that we listened first. The hearers uh, in the place where the Sāvaka Sangha began, so what we did was we began by listening, which is exactly what Anya Kondanya did. He listened to the teachings and he realized Anya Kondanya became the one who knew. So we were there listening and then we chanted. What did we chant? We chanted the, the Buddha's discovery of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, which is uh, what he discovered and what he set into motion, his description of that there in that place. So what he discovered he called the deathless or the unconditioned. And you remember we've talked about this a lot, when the Bodhisattva left the palace, it was because he had wholehearted faith, he had conviction that because there is death, because there is the conditioned, because there is sorrow, there must be the sorrowless, the deathless, the unconditioned. He had very strong conviction about that. And looking at his wife and child and his aging father, he was determined to find it, out of compassion because he wanted to find that deathless and teach it to others so that they could liberate themselves from samsara, is sometimes called the realm of death. And uh, after a long struggle, an incredibly sincere struggle, he discovered that. And uh, he discovered it through utilizing enough samadhi in conjunction with wise reflection. It's the middle way. And recollection. So he was recollecting his past lives, you recall. And then he was seeing, he got down to seeing what the cause of birth was, the craving, the attachment, and the ignorance. And then he, in seeing that with mindfulness, so there's these various path factors. You need strong mindfulness, you need the samadhi, and then you need the wise reflection, and then you need the focus. So it's several things, those five spiritual powers, several things working in harmony, producing basically ignorance, not knowing, and because of not knowing, seeing and perceiving things incorrectly, that's delusion, by training our mindfulness, which is that which sees correctly, delusion is uprooted and ignorance disappears. What happens when delusion is uprooted and ignorance disappears is that your nature, which was defiled, which was covered over with a veil of delusion, or that that dust in the eyes, when the dust is out of the eyes, you realize the nature of your mind. And the nature of your mind is unconditioned. And it doesn't die. And this is a subtle thing. That's why it requires many things to be in place. A foundation of generosity, uh, impeccable virtue, and then this training in mindfulness, and enough samadhi, and then right skillful reflection, and then insight is what occurs. Seeing Ajahn Anand often describes, we saw him today, we paid respects to him, Ajahn Anand, Ajahn Anand describes that when you see either impermanence very, very clearly in your meditation, <coughs> or if you see <coughs> unsatisfactoriness very, very clearly in your meditation, or if you see anatha, not self, as an insight in your meditation, you, when you see one of these, you will see the other two. Because when the mind sees the truth clearly, one aspect of the truth, delusion falls away and then you see the other characteristics because they go together and then when you see anicca, dukkha and anatta you experience the emptiness of your mind it's empty of self empty of grasping that's the experience of insight when you see anicca, dukkha and anatta you experience the emptiness of your mind and the emptiness of all phenomena uh, emptiness of solidity in particular emptiness of self. The experience of emptiness that you experience in your mind is described as the unconditioned and the deathless, the sorrowless. So that's right there, under a layer of ignorance. And so the Buddha explained to us, the Eightfold Path is what we cultivate, the Four Noble Truths is what we realize. Suffering is to be known. So this is what we do in our meditation. We often come to the meditation as one of the hindrances of some of the kilesas. You have a good look at that. Oh, this is suffering, and you know it. And seeing it clearly, second noble truth, the cause of suffering is to be abandoned. And Ajahn Chah says so much of practice is about letting go, letting go of the cause of suffering. So skillful meditators can do this. If you don't meditate, you can't. Your kilesas and defilements and your hindrances will have their way with you. You'll just pick them up and you'll spin around endlessly. 
But if you really have some mindfulness and some samadhi, and you're really looking at that suffering, and you have faith that it's not you, Ajahn Chah says, make big suffering to little suffering, make little suffering into no suffering, and you get some experience of letting it go, you can just be mindfully aware of it, and patient and determined to sit with it until you let it go, and you can let it go. And then you have small experiences of cessation of suffering. It's not the big experience of cessation of suffering, but it's a small experience of cessation of suffering. You can see it in your own mind, in your own meditation, daily, and it should give you confidence. You see that suffering that I just had five minutes ago? It's not there now. Suffering is something that I do. Suffering is my response to life. And the Lord Buddha is saying, when you recognize the cause of suffering, where's the clinging? Where's the grasping? Based in delusion. What's the delusion? So a lot of what we have to do is investigate the self and investigate the body, investigate emotions, and see that there's no self there. We're very committed to thinking there is, and it's a very, very deep habit that we have, and on a conventional level, fair enough. But when you have a really close look at it, whenever you're suffering, the way you let go of your suffering is to have a really close look. Arjun Chah says, the place where the suffering is, is the place where the suffering ceases. So have a good look in meditation discipline. Where's the suffering? What's it based in? It's based in some kind of a craving. Either you wanted something that you're not getting, or you're getting something that you don't want. And then when you contemplate in various ways, the simple truth of karma, the very the simple facts of existence, that we all age, we all get separated from things that we love, none of us get everything we want all the time, suffering is the result, that's the human lot, and you just accept it, and uh, we have to drop our sense of entitlement often, we, uh, drop our unreasonable expectations and have a look at our attachment and let them go. And the experience of letting go of your attachment is, of course, peace. That's the really good news, that when you let go of your attachment, like it sounds a bit, it sounds a bit harsh, it sounds a bit grueling, let go of my attachment, or let go of my attachment. But then what happens when you do? You feel much better. You feel much happier. So this part of recognizing the cause of suffering being attachment, then cultivating those qualities which will give you the energy and the power to let go of them, the Eightfold Path or the Five Spiritual Powers. When you have enough mindfulness, you have enough concentration, you have some wisdom, you can think skillfully, you can let go of suffering. And then you can contemplate not self. And as you do this, you're laying the foundation for deeper and deeper insights. So, this is what the Buddha discovered. He discovered his own nature. And in that discovery, this is really affirming and many of us experience it. It's almost like you can feel it or smell it or touch it under the Bodhi tree in Bogaya. You can, you get an inkling, an intuition for your own potential. What the Buddha realized was the potential of conscious beings. And I'm conscious, here I am, meditating under the Bodhi tree, and I'm feeling more peace and more clarity and more stillness than I usually do. This is pointing to something. This is pointing to your ability to realize the deathless. But we have to work. We have to work at it. That's right effort. We have to be disciplined and we have to be focused. And so what we're doing, accumulating merits and listening to Dhamma and paying respects to wise beings and making the wish to hear more Dhamma, to pay respects to more wise beings, to do more retreats, to keep cultivating the insight. We're on track. And what we have to do is keep on track. And, uh, so that's probably all I'm going to say today. Sandamayang Ubaratama Kataya Sadhu Karandarama Sidi Sadhu 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 Anumodami Twenty nine and a half minutes. I said I'd keep it to half an hour. <laughs> <laughs>